This is Michael. This is the Street Preacher's Corner podcast, the podcast where I think the G valve on my accordion is sticking a little bit, but in her defense, she was made while the uh, while Mussolini was the dictator of Italy. She's got a few miles on her. Took her to Wisconsin a couple years back to get her fixed because there's nobody very often uh, nearby anyway that, that fixes accordions. And when the guy opened up the case, he said. Uh, do you have any idea how old this thing is? I said, I know exactly how old it is. And he said, so you're not expecting any miracles. And he cleaned it up and got it up and, and, and running. And it's been a handful of years. And it just sounds to me like there's a little bit of a rattle uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the G uh, major button there in the chords and the valves. And uh, half of what I was doing there was just playing around trying to find out where the rattle's coming from. Uh, so anyway. Thank you for listening. Uh, so let's just cover some things. That we're, we're going to Mark Lesson 24 is what I'm calling it, the unpardonable sin. But before we get into that, I'm going to talk to you about real quick about what's going on in my family. Those of you that are in the know, those of you that don't know, I'm not the sort of person that advertises a whole lot of stuff publicly, but we had a medical situation with our family that has taken up um, all of my life or a good chunk of my life for uh weeks now it feels like anyway uh, it's been yeah it's been my i think we're coming up on a third week here my son is uh, at, a, at a facility uh, out of state uh where he is undergoing rehabilitation for um injuries sustained during a very strange neurological event that no one can explain and that's really what i want to say about that and uh i do want to say that the body of christ and all this has been great um been wonderful Sometimes as a street preacher, you do feel like you're all alone in this thing, that uh, nobody cares about you or your ministry, and, and really, you, you know, you can live with that. I mean, I, I can live with that anyway. Uh, but uh, people really closed ranks around us and, and helped us uh, with food and with finances and other things. And, 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 and um, I think I need to try to con somebody to come over and mow my yard, though. Anyway. But son is uh, healthy and uh, healthy-ish on the mend and... Um, um, Considering the fact that he was unresponsive for about four days, um, you know, we can live with everything else. Mark, lesson 24, we're going to talk about the unpardonable sin. Now, I will come up straight up, admit to you, I think I owe that to you, that when it comes to the unpardonable sin, I don't entirely know what I'm talking about. Um, I, uh, I... I had, and because of that, I've been dragging my feet a little bit on getting to this topic. Uh, I mean, I've been covering some other things and doing church history stuff, some of which has been very well received and some of which has been received like everything else I do. Um, I don't like looking like a dummy. Uh, you'd think I'd be used to it by now, but I, just, I don't, still don't like it. Uh, but I also want to be honest, if I don't know how, if I don't understand something, I don't understand it. That doesn't mean we're going to avoid it. That doesn't mean we're going to attribute it to some other thing. We're just going to deal with it. So when it comes to this matter of the unpardonable sin, I know some people that, that worry a lot about it. I don't worry about it at all for reasons I'll get into maybe uh, at some point in all this. But um, but but what we're, so what we're going to do is we're going to do what honest, sincere Bible students have always done with difficult passages. We're going to look at all the verses. We're going to look at it from several different angles, every angle that I can think of. And then we'll, you know, we'll see what we can see. So Mark 3 is where we're at. Uh, verse 28, Verily I say unto you, All sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewithsoever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation, because they said he hath an unclean spirit. Now we're going to look at the, the parallel passage in Matthew before we jump, jump off into this. Matthew 12, I think is where it's at. And... Uh, Here we go. Verse 31 of Matthew 12. Um, well, let me back up to verse 30. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me is scattered abroad. Somebody should preach on that one these days. Wherefore, I say unto you, all men are, wherefore, so in other words, because of that, because of verse 30, which is not mentioned in Mark, uh, because of verse 30, 
Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Which, by the way, is a verse that the Catholic Church uses to prove that you can have sins forgiven after you're dead. Which, let's not chase that rabbit just right now. So according to Jesus Christ, there is a sin for which there is no forgiveness. That sin he refers to when he sticks a name on it. He says it's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So it's worth pointing out that a lot of people have a lot of um, uh, theories about what this is. Um, and one of my issues with this passage of Scripture, one of the difficulties for me is, is that uh, for something that appears to be very, very important, I mean, everything Jesus says is important, but for something that is very, very important, it's not super clear what he's talking about. And so because of that, lots of people come with lots of theories. We're going to talk about a couple of these theories and why I don't personally buy into them. So some people say that if you say anything uh, that God is doing and, and, and you don't realize God is doing it, that uh, or you don't give God credit, or you attribute truth to error, then you have committed the unpardonable sin. For example, let's say... Let's say that... Uh, Kenneth Copeland is a real deal instead of a, a charlatan. Charlatan. Uh, let's say he's a real deal instead of a con man. And and so let's say we live in an alternate universe where Kenneth Copeland is the real deal. And in that alternate universe, I look at Kenneth Copeland's ministry and I say, that man is of the devil. Well, some people would say that I've just committed the unpardonable sin. I was in the Navy, and we were, uh, you know, in the Navy, you, uh, you go out to sea, you know, because because sailors go to ships and ships go to sea. And uh, the uh, the Christians all find each other on board, which they should. And uh, they, they we had these little Bible studies, little, uh, you know, uh, chapel kind of services. Uh, nothing official, though, at least not on the ships I was on. And so it would be organized by a bunch of us guys, a bunch of us Christians, and, uh, you know, we take turns preaching or go, do a Bible study or whatever. And, then, and so, so some people would have tapes. Yes, I was in the Navy a million years ago. You know, when ships were made of steel and men were made of something else. Um, and a, um, so anyway, the, uh, the, the, the people had these tapes sent to them from their home church. And we would sometimes we'd play these tapes uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a sort of a church service, right? You'd sit there and they'd put the guy, they'd put the tape cassette tape and the cassette tape player and uh and then we'd listen to this thing and you know and 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 that would be our church service maybe sing a hymn or two so this one guy he had a female pastor which i'm not a fan of for first timothy three reasons and uh so he put this tape in and i said look man i said i don't i don't understand this i don't get this i said i i can't imagine a being a man and sitting there having a woman instruct me and just and just taking it i, I don't get it i said i don't think i don't think it's legit I don't think your pastor's legit. He said, oh, brother, I'm sorry to hear that. He said, you know what you've done? You've committed the unpardonable sin. You've attributed the works of the Holy Ghost to the devil. Okay. Well, so that's one take. That's one position is that if you take something that God is doing and you don't realize God's doing it and you don't give God credit or you attribute truth to error, then you have committed the unpardonable sin. And... Because some people think that's how it works, um, you, you, you see situations where there's absolute looney tune, you know, wackadoodle nonsense going on in the name of ministry. And people are afraid sometimes to speak out of it, out of it because if they're wrong, then they've just committed the unpardonable sin. So the problem with that, though, is the Bible tells us to mark those that are offensive and cause you know, contrary doctrine. Uh, that are divisive, uh, tells us to uh, point out false teachers and to point out the, why they're false and to be able to you know, give an answer to every man of the hope that lieth in us. And all those verses in the New Testament about how to deal with, with brethren who are preaching falsehood and the way you, the, the proper approach is not to be afraid to call it out. Uh, and, 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 the, and the, uh, the proper approach is not to be sure whether or not they're teaching something false. If a man teaches anything, I should be able to take a Bible and discern for myself whether or not what that man is saying is true. And if that man is preaching falsehood, if that man is spreading error, then I have a, an obligation to, to call that out. And so do you. So that possibly, so doing that, 
can't possibly be bless me against the Holy Ghost. Um, tell you what, tell you what. If it's a matter of simply, um, if the unpardonable sin is simply a matter of thinking that God is not involved in something that He is, then let's, 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 John six, John sixteen, John sixteen. Verse 1, these things have I spoken to you, you should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues, yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that they he doeth God's service. And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. So according to Jesus, some of the uh, uh, enemies of the church will have, have completely well-meaning intentions. And they do it not because they hate God but because they don't know God or they, they think they're serving God. And the error is that they not is, is, is not knowing that they don't know God, but not, let me, let me say this right. Their error is they don't know God the way they think they do. And so in their sincerity and in their zeal to serve God, the way they understand, they put themselves in opposition to the, to the truth. This is not a person who tr knows the truth, understands the truth and does the opposite. This is someone who is in error and is spiritually blind, and they, and so they even they even to the point of killing Christians. And they think in doing so, they're doing God's service, and God acknowledges that even in their error, they are sincere. So the Muslim that blows himself up to try to kill infidels, according to the Bible, he's not right, but it, but he's not insincere. That's pretty interesting. Now, and so the question is, do we have any examples of that? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, Galatians 1. My point in chasing this rabbit is just to point out that it can't possibly just be attributing the works of God to the devil because that happens. Galatians 1. Uh, about verse 11, I think. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was, was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For ye heard of my conversation in times past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my father. So, so did Paul commit the unpardonable sin? I mean, he looked at Christians and saw them as workers of iniquity. He saw them as, as enemies of the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And he did it with noble intentions. By his own admission, he did it because he was zealous of the traditions of his fathers. I mean, that's interesting, isn't it? I mean, that, that, that's really something. So if this is the unpardonable sin, just attributing the works of the Holy Ghost to the devil. I mean, the birth of the church, the growth of the church, that is a work of the Holy Ghost. You can prove that a dozen different ways. And if, if it's just simply attributing the works of the Holy Ghost to the devil, then two-thirds of your, your uh, uh, New Testament was written by a guy who did that very thing. In fact, uh, uh, where's the verse? Oh, first, first Timothy 1. First Timothy 1. Verse 12, and I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry who was before a blasphemer. Now, I get it that Mark and Matthew both say uh, that you can blaspheme against the Son, it's fine, you'll be forgiven. And if you blaspheme against the Father, it's fine, it's for, then you'll be forgiven. But if you blaspheme against the Holy Ghost, you're, you won't be forgiven. What's not totally clear to me is how exactly you do that. So the only way for sure that I know that you could do that. Let me, because it says, it says in Mark 3, it says, because they said he hath an unclean spirit. So this sin, this unpardonable sin, is something you don't commit with your heart, you commit with your mouth. Okay, so well, let's go with that then. So the only way for sure that I know that you could commit the, holy, the, the unpardonable sin is get in a time machine and go back to this part of history where this thing in Mark 3 is happening and be standing there and say with your mouth that he hath a devil. He accused Jesus Christ, who was enabled and empowered by the Holy Spirit of God, in him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you take that guy and you accuse him of having a devil, then you have you have you have met all the conditions in this passage for having committed the unpardonable sin. 
But Paul right there says he's a blasphemer in First Timothy uh, 1. So, so maybe he committed blasphemy when he blasphemed. He blasphemed against the Son, presumably, and that was forgiven to him. But then here's where I can't, here's another thing that I can't get my brain around. If the Holy Spirit is God, and he is, I mean, you know, these three bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. If the Holy Spirit is God, and he is, then any blasphemy against God is technically blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So why would it be in a different category? Except that it obviously is. Strange stuff. So one of the other things people say uh, about... Uh, what this, what this, you know, some people say that it's attributing the works of God to the devil. Um, it's an interesting case, but I, I don't, I just don't know how you, I don't know how the mechanics of it work out. Some people say that uh, the uh, unpardonable sin is rejecting the gospel. Um, I, you know, I, I preach to some guys that believe this. They say that, you know, God has appointed a day in which you're going to get saved or that he wants you to get saved in which the gospel is presented to you and you are expected to respond appropriately. Uh, God hath commanded all men everywhere to repent. And so if you don't, and then God chooses to never deal with you again, you will have been presented the gospel, you have reje well, rejected the gospel, and that is the one thing that God cannot forgive is you rejecting the gospel. You will have sinned away your day of grace. Sending away the day of grace is sort of the, the, the shorthand for that. And that's an interesting argument, and I get, I get it. I get it. I get it. And it sort of runs parallel to the, 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 the only sin that sends a man to hell is rejecting the gospel. And I've, I've preached with the guys. I remember one specific thing where Georgia, Florida, again, there was a guy down there with us. Um, and, 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 and so we're, we're parking. And so what we do is we go to this big football game and we park and we uh, usually park like on the moon and walk in for miles to get to this stadium because the parking is uh, the closer you get to the stadium, the more expensive it is. And I have paid $100 to park to go preach for free. I promise you, I've done it and done it and done it. Um, but anyway, so we parked away. Usually we park a ways out because I'd rather walk than pay. So anyway, we're parked in. We're getting out, and this, this guy comes up to us. He sees our shirts and our signs and everything. And he comes up, and he says, my brother is a homosexual. Is he going to hell? Well, the correct answer is yes. But if you say that, then the conversation just kind of gets shut down right away. So you kind of have to, you know, it's an issue, but it's not the issue. So the guy that was with me, he said, the only sin that sends a man to hell is rejecting Jesus Christ. Now, I know what the guy meant when he said that. Because anything else you do, um, God will forgive it if you accept the gospel. So rejecting the gospel is sort of the ultimate thing. It's, it's your last chance. The gospel is your last chance to fix the situation. And if you don't do it, then then there's no hope for you. You're out hope without God and you'll die in your sins if God stops dealing with you. If God does not grant you a place of repentance. So I get what, what he's trying to say. But when, when he said that to that fellow, that, I could see the dude's face. And the dude walked away thinking, oh, good. My brother-in-law, or his brother or his brother-in-law, whoever it was, is okay. Because, the, because his homosexuality is not sending him to hell. Okay, so, so when you say, the only sin that sends a man to hell is rejecting the gospel, I think that is a true statement, but it's not, a, it's not a statement that always holds up. Let me explain. Um, the idea is accepting Jesus will result in the pardon of any sin, and so ultimately, you know, this is why people wind up in hell. They never accept Christ. And the proof, well, here's, here's the proof text. Okay, if I was going to prove this, if I was going to prove that statement, here's where I would go. I'd go to John 3. You know, I know things I disagree with, and I know where the verses are, and that makes life interesting sometimes. Okay, here we go. He that believe, Verse 18, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So, the condemnation is this, right? Uh, verse uh, verse uh, 19, this is the condemnation that lights come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds are evil. The condemnation that is already on a man when he's born and when he's just walking around in his natural self, the condemnation that already exists on that man is there because he loves his sin, because he loves darkness rather than light. And that attitude, that heart fixation, that that position, that attitude towards sin, his sin, your sin, my sin, uh, is offensive to God. 
and repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Part of that repentance uh, is, is realizing the damage your sin is doing in the offensiveness of your sin and addressing your sin with the only thing that can address it, which is faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm not trying to be overly, you know, make this bigger than it is, but it's a big deal. So, so you go to verse 18, it says, He that believeth him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. So if you don't believe in Jesus, you're condemned already. Yes, that's true. That's a true statement. That's a true statement. Uh, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So people will say, like I said, the only sin that sends a man to hell is the sin of rejecting Jesus Christ. And I know what they mean when they say it. I, I, I get it. I really do. And I don't think it's an end of the world you know, kind of statement where, oh, we can't be friends anymore. I just think it's a very... It's a very insufficient explanation of, of sort of the mechanics of things. Okay, so tell you what, Revelation 21. Revelation 21. Uh, Revelation 21, verse uh Tell you what, we'll start at verse 6, because I don't like to start in the middle of a sentence. Uh, he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst the fountain of the water of life freely. Okay? You can run all the references on what the fountain of life, of life is. Uh, you know, John 10, I think it's where, or John 14, one of those ones. He that overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Verse 8, But the fearful and the unbelieving, the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, shall have their part in the lake of fire, which burnt the fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So you're going to say it's unbelief that puts a man in hell. Unbelief puts a man in hell. But there's a list right there, and not everybody on that list, the, in addition to being, obviously there's no there's no believers in hell, right? But uh, there's, there, there's not just, you know, you, you did nothing else in your life, and then, and, then, and then what condemned you is unbelief. You did a bunch of other stuff in your life, and then what what cut you off from the solution to all those other things was your unbelief. So there's a list there, but it's not the only thing in the list. So so the okay so so the idea that the only sin that that damns a man is 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 not accepting Jesus. It works great in a culture where Bibles are plenty and gospel teaching and preaching is available. But let's say you grew up in the mountains of Pakistan. You, let's say you were a woman uh, and you were the betrothed wife of some goat herder. You remember, um, I don't know if you've ever seen, there's there's a picture they took in the 70s, I think it was the seven, or late 70s, of this young girl in uh, National Geographic took it. And it became one of their most famous covers. And she's probably, I don't know, 9 or 10 in this picture. And she has the most amazingly blue eyes just amazing blue eyes and she's looking right at the camera and she looks like she's a little 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 you know torqued off that somebody's taking her picture but they took that picture in some refugee camp somewhere and that became their cover and they never got the girl's name and they never whatever and so then years 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 later they somehow found her and she had no idea that she was famous she had no idea that billions of people had seen her picture she vaguely remembered the picture being taken she had lived the next several decades uh, without electricity, without books, without TV, internet, smartphone, blah, blah, I mean, whatever, all that stuff that makes you connect to the rest of the world. She was, she woke up and lived and died or lived and worked every day in a world that was pretty much identical to the way her ancestors had lived. Okay. So let's say you're that person, that sort of person. You're illiterate. You're dirt poor. You are nomadic. You've never even seen a book, let alone a Bible. That person, a person in that situation, they die. Because that's what people do. What happens? I mean, you didn't, you, you know, you're, here you are, you're the, you're the illiterate goat herder. You didn't reject Jesus, did you? But no, because you've never heard of Jesus. Right? You say, oh, well, everybody knows. No, man, no, man. There are lots of people that don't know. The gospel has, has, has gotten to every place, but the gospel has not gotten to everybody. There are some places you cannot go. 
there's some places that you just, nobody knows those people are there. So what does God do with those people? If the, if, if the unforgivable sin, if the unpardonable sin is rejecting Jesus, what do you do with a man who has never heard of Jesus? This is where I'm going with this. I get it, an American. I get an American who sees a street preacher preaching, who gets a gospel tract handed to him, who hears a gospel message on the radio, and he just blows right past it. For, he turns it down and goes on his sin. Yes, yes that man... Yes, he has treading through the blood of Jesus Christ. He's going to stand before God. He's going to give an account of everything he's ever done. And then on top of it, the nail in the coffin was that the thing that, that really put it for, to him was his rejection of Jesus Christ. It's the same thing as if you were dying of some terrible disease brought on by your sin and, and, and you're dying from that disease and someone comes along and offers you a cure and you reject that cure. So now, now you're still dying, but you're dying for different reasons. You're dying. Well, you're dying from for an additional reason. You're dying because not only did you have this this disease brought on by sin, but you have rejected the cure. So I get that if we're talking about a, an American or a European or or you know or, you know whatever. But if you're talking about somebody in the far reaches in the corner of the world, how does that work? Well, I I think it's pretty clear from how for how it works. So let's look at Romans two. You say, Mike, what are you, where are we going with this? Well, I'm just I'm covering some of the most common things that people say are the unpardonable sin and why I don't think they are. Romans 2. Uh, let's see. I always have a hard time finding this verse. Here we go. Verse 14. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of man by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. So here's the idea. Back to our friend, the illiterate goat herder. They, they, they do things that they know are wrong. And the reason they know they're wrong is not because their society tells them, but although it may. Uh, you can take a guy who's never heard, never seen a Bible. You see that in the book of Genesis, where, where, where uh, you know, uh, uh, that guy uh, that Abraham ran into, whose name can I, I can't remember right now. Uh, that guy, he, uh, he knew it was wrong to take your Abraham's wife. He didn't have a Bible, but he knew. Why? Romans 2. God wrote that on, on that man's heart. So people may disagree about some of the particulars and their culture may make things worse because their culture may be horribly degraded. But people understand some things and God holds that man accountable for what he knows. So that man lusts after another man's wife. He knows he shouldn't. He feels guilty about it. He feels shameful about it. Uh, that, that ignorant goat herder in Pakistan knows right from wrong. And when he's done wrong, God counts it. The God who's looking at him the whole time, that God counts it to him as sin. Now that man dies, God holds him accountable for the things he knew he should do that he didn't, and he holds him accountable for the things that he shouldn't have done that he did. I mean, God is fairer than you and me. God does not hold a man responsible for rejecting a gospel that he never heard, but God does hold a man responsible for, for ignoring the counsel of his own heart, for ignoring his own conscience. God holds a man accountable for that. So, simply saying, that guy didn't accept Jesus, so now he's in hell. Well, that's true. But he's not in hell just for accepting for rejecting Jesus. He could be in hell for any number of reasons. So it can't be, it can't be that. It can't be just attributing the works of God to the devil, and it can't just simply be rejecting the gospel. I mean, if it was just rejecting the gospel... Some people reject the gospel for decades and finally get saved. And if it worked the way you say it does, then the first time they rejected the gospel, God would be done with them. And he'd be justified in doing so. So then what in the world is this unpardonable sin? Well, uh, let me just deviate here a little bit here. I believe that I cannot lose my salvation. I believe that Jesus Christ paid for all my sins, including the sins I haven't committed yet. And, 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 and if you want to if you wanna, uh, uh, figure out why I think that, um, it's not because I embraced a little one saved, always saved, you know, acronym, whatever. Um, you can go, I did a, 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 
and a podcast thing where uh, how to lose your salvation. And I went through every argument people use for losing your salvation and why it doesn't work. So, there is no sin I could commit that could that could endanger my soul. There's it's just there's just not. Um, so I don't spend a lot of time worried about the unpardonable sin. And it's also weird to me, and I think I've said this before, that for something that's apparently important enough to, to for Jesus to say, and important enough for the Holy Spirit to have written down in two different places, for something to be so stinking important, it's not super clear exactly what it is. When, when the Bible uh, defines blasphemy in the Old Testament, it defines it as, Using God's name in vain. Okay, so blasphemy against God, sure, he'll forgive you. Blasphemy against the Father, sure, he'll forgive you. Blasphemy against the Son, sure, he'll forgive you. Blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, he won't forgive you. It's very strange. And what's strange about it is, other than this one little instance, a very specific uh, uh, spot in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in like, like, I mean, the whole thing's over in just a matter of minutes, this, this, this encounter. In the, in, the, in the ministry of Jesus Christ, the unforgivable, unpardonable sin is never mentioned again. And I get there's lots of things, lots of really important things that are only mentioned once in the Bible. But let, let me show you something. Um, let's look at uh, 1 Corinthians 6. Okay, here we go. This is, this is a list of past sins that hadn't been committed, had been habitually, had been a part of life, a way of life for the church at Corinth. Okay? Okay, here we go. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall, the, shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. So in the church at Corinth, you had former fornicators and former idolaters and former adulterers and former effeminate, no, former homosexuals, former abusers of themselves of mankind, the Leviticus 17 area, former thieves, former people who are covetous, former drunkards, former revilers, former extortioners. Pretty rough crowd there. But God had saved them. In that list, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is not mentioned. And in all the Pauline epistles, not once are you warned to not commit the unpardonable sin. I mean, strange stuff. You think, because there's lots of things that Jesus warned against that Paul also warned the church against. But not that. So then how in the world does that work? Yeah, this is my pause for dramatic effect. Um, the short answer is, I don't know. But the Bible says, These things that I have written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. So I can know that I have eternal life. I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to fret about it. I don't have to run around constantly checking up on my salvation. Uh, I am maintained by the faith of Jesus Christ. I am my, my sins are washed away. I am, I am, he promised he'd never leave me for, nor forsake me. So whatever the unpardonable sin is, as a believer, I, I'm not in danger of it. Because I am not in danger of eternal damnation. So what is it? Well, apparently, it is standing on the ground in, in you know, modern-day Palestine in the 30, 31, 32, 33 A.D., when the Son of God is delivering people from devils and accusing him of doing it by the power of devils. Because that's what happened. All this other stuff that people say, this is the unpardonable sin. That's the unpardonable sin. What what people do when they write this stuff up and when they when they do you know big studies on it is there's not a whole lot to study on. So what you have to do is you have to cover all the verses that we've already covered, and then you just have to assign something as being the unpardonable sin that's not necessarily in the text, and then you have to uh, you know kind of scare people into not doing that sin. That's sort of the the approach. 
I asked a buddy of mine, I said, what do you think that unpardonable sin is? He said, I think it's something you should avoid doing. And then I said, oh, come on, you're, you're no fun, man. You got to give me you got to give me some kind of wackadoodle theory I can sink my teeth into. But uh, he didn't have one. So, uh, so, so back to Mark 3. I mean, we could, you know, we can, we can keep saying, I don't know. How many different ways can you say, I don't know? Um, we're going to look at it again. Make sure we didn't miss anything. Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men and blasphemies whatsoever that with, wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost shall never, hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation because they said, he hath an unclean spirit. So if you want to worry that there's some sin out there, some very, I don't want to say poorly defined, but maybe poorly understood sin out there, that if you commit it, you're done, then how could you ever, if we don't understand what it is, how could you ever know that you've committed it? And if you don't know you've committed it and it could damn your soul, then how will you ever know for sure that you have eternal life? How will you ever know that your sins are forgiven? How will you ever know that, that, your, that, that, that your eternal destination is settled? Well, you can't. But the Bible says you can. So there you go. I mean, I feel like I, I feel like I ought to give you your money back, except I'm already doing this for free. But if I'm honest, I, I just I don't know what that is. And so we're going to read these. The, we're going to read the verses following and uh, finish it out that way. We're going to finish out verse uh, chapter three. There came then his brethren and his mother and standing without sent unto him, calling him. And the multitude said about him. And they said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren without seek by, uh, for thee. And he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brethren? It is interesting to me that the the position of the Catholic Church is that Jesus dropped everything every time Mary needed something, or every time, every time Mary wanted something, anytime Mary had an idea, Jesus followed up on it. You don't get that from the Bible. Here, he's teaching the crowds. His family is there, but his family and his brethren. So he has, you know, uh, uh, he's got brothers, he's got sisters. Uh, it's just Mary was not a perpetual virgin. That's just ridiculous. She had other children after Jesus. If she had, if she was a perpetual virgin. Then she withheld herself from her husband, and that was a sin under the Levitical law that she lived under. But anyway, so multitude said about him, they said, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren without seek for thee, and answered them, Who is my mother or my brethren? Jesus snubbed his own family sometimes. Not snubbed, but he, he, he you know, the, he, there are things going on that are more important than your family. There are there are tasks that have to be accomplished in a certain amount of time that are more important than than your family. And Jesus understood that, and Jesus lived that. He looked around upon on them, which sat about him, and said, "Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same as my brother and my sister and mother." So. You know, so Paul, so Paul, for example, Paul saw Timothy as a son. He referred to him as the son of the faith. You've heard a handful of people as his son of the faith. Um, I think there are people that is, you're, you're, they are your father in the faith in the sense that they led you to Christ, and there are people that are the, the father in your faith in, in that they taught you, instructed you, mentored you. Um, and man, I got a long list of people like that, some of whom are a little controversial. Uh, but some who aren't. And so when God saves you, God takes you out of the family you were born into. In my case, born into a family of, you know, uh, rough characters and, and criminals and that sort of thing. He takes you out of that family and he puts you into another family, his family. And in that new family, you have brethren and you have fathers, and you have mothers and you have sisters and you have this new family because you are members one of another with every other saved person that ever has lived. Paul has been dead for 2,000 years, and Paul is my brother. Darnell is as black as this laptop that I'm using to record this, and Darnell is my brother. James Manilau is as Filipino as they come, and he is my brother. He is more my brother than my actual relatives. And if you've been saved for any length of time, you know that. And Jesus points that out right here. Whosoever shall do the will of God the same as my brother and my sister and my mother. 
so the Bible says that God hath commanded all men to uh, everywhere to repent. Uh, so, the, you know, the will of God uh, for your life, the primary will of God for your life is that you accept Jesus Christ, have your sins forgiven. And when you do that, God makes you a joint heir with Jesus Christ. You are Jesus Christ's brother. Or, yeah, I guess, sister, as the case may be. It's weird how we're called sons of God. We're only called daughters of God in like one spot in First Corinthians. But that's that's neither here nor there. So, so, so the do, so those that do the will of God, so those that accept Christ, they are mothers and brethren, and, and so, and so, it, so well, that would sort of indicate, although it doesn't come out and say it, that would sort of indicate that although you had some of Jesus's blood relatives that accepted him, you had some Jesus's relatives that didn't accept him. We know James did. We know uh, uh, Jude did, because um, they're they're mentioned later on as you know being part of the ministry. But as far as all that stuff goes, man, there there were you know there were aunts and in laws and whatever. We don't know what happened to those guys. And accepting Christ puts you in a different category as far as family relations go. And you may find yourself. I mean, look, some of you guys, you your parents are great, and your parents are lovely, and your parents raise you in church, and your parents love God, and everybody worships together, and it's it's wonderful, and you have that communion. I do not have that in my extended family. My mom's lost. My dad is. I don't know what my dad is. He's he's. I don't know. Uh, you know, outlaws, in-laws. I mean, how you go out? For, my whole family is just—they're just—they're just vagabonds. They're—they're they're criminals. They're—they're they're whatever. And so, so uh, you know, I got an uncle who's a, literally a devil worshiper. Um, all that stuff. And and so, um, the thing you have with your family—not everybody has. My point is, that, and and some of us we have to make choices between our family and the ministry, or between our family and the gospel, or between our family. And righteousness, and when you do that, you you, you can do it without being a jerk. You can do it without being a jerk, I guess. Uh, but you, there's going to come a cost associated with that, because they're going to take your choosing the ministry over them, or choosing Jesus over them. They're going to take it as you rejecting them, your own blood relatives. And if you've never been there. Man, it is a terrible, terrible, heartbreaking situation because you cannot make them understand that I have to go with what Jesus says instead of what Grandma says. I have to go with what Jesus says instead of what you say. And all I can tell you is I know everything there is to know about that. <laughs> everything. There are periods in my life where my own mother would not speak to me. My own mother tried to have my kids taken away from me. Because we tried to stand for what Jesus wanted us to do. And not what she wanted us to do. But for whosoever shall do the will of God, the same as my brother and my sister and mother. When God saved you, he gave you a family that extends out in every direction, deep into the roots of history and into the future. He gave you a fellowship. He gave you uh, a, a group of people that have their problems and, and, and sometimes don't have a whole lot in common. But we have Jesus in common, and that will always be enough. Well, I'm going to stop now uh, before the phone rings again. And uh, thank you for listening, all four of you. Um, this has been this is Michael. This has been the Street Preacher Corner Podcast. And I will see you on the other side.